is Bro Perkins. I'm a medium and I've been giving psychic readings for 20 years. My mission is to demystify the mystical and educate the public that we do not die and life is about growth. This is ARC, the Afterlife Research Center. So my guest today is award-winning journalist, investigative journalist at that, Tom Schroeder. I came across Tom's book when I was a teenager. He wrote a book called Lost Souls, where he tagged along and shadowed Dr. Ian Stevenson, a personal hero of mine, who was the head of psychiatry at the University of Virginia, but actually grew up in Montreal, where I'm from, and uh, graduated McGill University, where I would have gone. So Dr. Ian Stevenson and Tom went to India and actually studied children who have past life memories. This work is absolutely fascinating, and. When you hear this interview, I think it'll open up a whole set of new horizons for you. Thank you for joining me, Tom. Uh, you know, you've been uh, a person that I've been impacted uh, by since I was a teenager. Being being a host, one of the coolest things for me is I get to talk to all the people who, who formed my uh, experience and knowledge about afterlife phenomena, and you're one of them. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So you're a award winning journalist who's been an investigative journalist and author and editor for something like 40 years. Is that right? <laughs> 43, actually. <laughs> wow. Okay, that's cool. Because this week I've been meeting a lot of young people that I get to say I've been doing something longer than they've been alive. But uh, now the tables are reversed. Wow. I feel young again suddenly. <laughs> I'm getting up there. <laughs> well, and I, I've looked at your list of uh, accomplishments and, uh, you know, in addition to to all of the editing that you've done and, and the publishing that you've done, um, what's interesting to me is you have a, a myriad of books and articles and only one of them out of all of your work has anything to do with the paranormal, it seems. Uh, well, I, there, I guess you could say that uh, my book Acid Test about um, the development of psychedelic drugs as a therapeutic tool could have some paranormal elements in it, but yes, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, I think a lot of authors sort of have one subject that they keep coming back to over and over again, but because I'm approaching this as a journalist, uh, sort of a general interest, uh, journalist, I, I just do things that I'm personally curious about. Hmm. And I came across Dr. Ian Stevenson uh, when I was doing a magazine story. Um, and I just found him so, I was doing, actually doing a magazine story about Dr. Brian Weiss, a, a psychiatrist who believed that when he was regressing his patients to sort of deal with some problem that they had, that they were going back to actual past lives. And so I did a story on him and, you know, I didn't find the evidence very persuasive because, you know, when people are under hypnosis, they're, they're you know, they're asked to fantasize really. They said, you know, just relax and let your mind do what it wants to do. And, they weren't coming up with past lives that where they had knowledge that they couldn't have gotten from other sources. So when I was researching that, I came across Ian Stevenson's work, which on the contrary, that he was looking for cases specifically where there was no easy explanation for how, and in this case, and this, and this was one of the things that appealed to me, his subjects were small children sometimes just learning how to talk who's like among their first sentences were you're not my real mom or you're not my real dad and then they go on to describe their real mom and their real dad mm -hmm. um, and in some cases they had enough detail eventually in their descriptions so that it matched eerily perfectly with some dead stranger that there was no real likelihood that the family had ever known these people or heard of them. And so, of course, this was in the days before the internet and, uh, and, uh, you know, right. it was before the internet for one thing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, or, I mean, and there also, there were plenty of, of people who 
we're remembering very common, ordinary people who would not have had an internet presence even today, you know, because, you know, in some cases they were dealing with, you know, poor people living in slums in India. Um, and the other thing that impressed me about it was that the, the, the lives that these children were remembering, most of them had no element of glamour or excitement or celebrity to it. So, I mean, there was no kind of wish fulfillment happening there. I mean, no apparent wish fulfillment because um, it wasn't like, you know, they were remembering the life of a princess or a movie star or, a, you know, or a, a Hall of Fame baseball player. You know, sometimes they were remembering the lives of, of people who were, um, you know, in a far lower station in life than they were. Um, so there was, you know, there was, you know, what Ian was doing was he was trying to rule out certain obvious motivations for coming up with these stories falsely, either through fantasy or wish fulfillment. Right. Or fraud, you know, or intentionally misleading people. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah. So I, I, you know, I just got completely interested in, in that, and and I called in up and at the University of Virginia. I mean, when I came across his work, I didn't even know if he was still alive. Mm -hmm. So you know, I called up the university, and he actually answered the phone. And uh, his first impulse was to say, you know, I don't want publicity um, because I, the only people I care about persuading our fellow scientists and anytime you get a, a popularized version of of this work it only causes me more headaches so going back to dr stevenson he he was um a canadian originally like me he, he grew up in my city montreal and he graduated from mcgill university in do you remember if it was psychiatry or psychology or both and he well he he actually went to medical school after that in New York and um, became a psychiatrist. Right, right. I remember he had quite a uh, extensive scientific uh, background. And that's something I've noticed in this paranormal research is a lot of these groundbreaking scientists who actually study psychic phenomena and afterlife phenomena seriously, end up having more credentials than the actual critics of their work. <laughs> Often well, he, was, he was, I mean, he was the uh, the director of psychiatry at the University of Virginia, the chairman of the, and, um, but, you know, his interest, his sort of side interest in this, which it started out as being a side interest, uh, compromised his position there. And it, it, you know, it was like basically embarrassing the university. Um, so basically they pushed him out, you know, but he had a choice. He could either, give up his research and, and continue on the normal career path, or he could give it up and he gave it up, but uh, he had a rich donor, um, Chester Carlson, who invented xerography, uh, who gave, basically funded a institute for him uh, to work out of. The symbology there is mind blowing, the Xerox, Xerox. machine. You know, it's it's copying and re recreating photocopies, and then of course yeah. reincarnation. That's that's amazing. I know, very good. <laughs> good observation. <laughs> so yeah, so now you you worked with Dr. Stevenson. So you get him on the phone, and he says, "I'm not interested in in fame or glory. I just want to convince other scientists and 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 propagate my research." How does that translate then to you writing the book Old Souls? Well, it, it took me two years to persuade him. And, you know, after that, at some point I wrote him a long letter, you know, saying, I understand and I admire uh, your skepticism about popularizing your work, but my interest in this is serious. And I sent him a book I wrote, um, the first book I had written, the only book at that point that I had written before. Um, and he actually read it. And I think that changed his mind. I think he read the book 
and had a feel for who I was as a writer and, a, and, and as a journalist. And um, then he said, well, so I called him and I actually went up to see him at the, uh, in Charlottesville. And he said, well, maybe you can come with me. I mean, I'm not sure I'm going to even do any more. I've you know, promised my wife I wasn't even going to do any more research trips. But I might do like one more sort of valedictory uh, pass in, in India and in, in Lebanon. And, you know, if that happens, you can, you can come with me. And uh, so that's what we ended up doing in, I believe it was in uh, 1997. In the in the fall and then winter of '98, we went to first to Lebanon and Beirut area, and then to um, India, all over Uttar Pradesh, uh, which is the sort of northern. That's where Delhi is and Agra. And wow! So that means in I think '99 or 2000, when I when I found your book in the school library, it must have been hot off the press at that time. It came out in in June of '99. Yeah. Wow. So I, I was uh, one of your first uh, uh-huh. Canadian readers, I bet. <laughs> cool. So so now what I noticed in the book is a lot of these cases originated in places like India, Lebanon, South America. There were a couple in America, um, and, and I don't even remember any cases in Canada, but what what is your explanation for that? Why, why are most of these children remembering past lives in those parts of the world versus here? Well, the you know, this is one thing that skeptics focused on. They said, oh, well, you know, of course, the, all these cases are, are happening to appear in places where um, reincarnation is an accepted belief. And uh, that, you know, might sound interesting at first blush, but then it's sort of like, well, wait a second. If the cultural belief in, that reincarnation is real could cause these cases to be manufactured, then why would the absolute cultural certainty that reincarnation is not real have the possibility of suppressing cases that might exist? And in fact, you know, my son used to say when I was a daddy and, you know, I treated it as a grammar problem. You know, I said, no, when you were, when you going to be a daddy in the future, he goes, no, when I was a daddy and, you know, and I, so you can imagine if kids are having some kind of memory or some kind of connection with a previous life, when everybody's telling them that, you know, they're wrong from the time they're four or five or whatever, when, as soon as they articulate it pretty soon, they just stop talking about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and there, and, you know, and then, but there also are cases in North America, um, and the, I think that at the time I did the book, there just weren't cases that were as developed and as convincing because the details were lacking. You know, if you don't have a lot of details, you can't have an impressive confirmation of matching the details of an actual life. And there were some cases where there were a lot of details, but those tended to be same family cases, I, you know, like a, a dead uncle or a dead grandparent or something. And, you know, and in that case, it's just too easy to imagine that possibly, you know, there was wishful thinking among family members that a dead family member. And stories passed down that the children hear. Stories passed down that they could have known about, you know, even even though these parents were saying, I swore I never told them about Uncle Johnny's falling off the roof. And yet that's the thing he said he remembered, you know. And you say, well, maybe you didn't, but maybe you heard it somewhere, you know. So it just wasn't as clean cut, even though the things the children said and the way the children behaved were identical to the cases in India and Lebanon. I mean, they just were carbon copies of those cases. They had all the same features, the children, they presented the same way, you know, when the children were beginning to speak. Um the children talked about it, some cases insistently for a few years. And then like when they were, you know, sort of became social beings, you know, like at seven or so, they, they stopped talking about it pretty much. Um, and since that time, 
since the book came out, there have been some very impressive American cases um, where, you know, there were a lot of interesting details. I mean, one kid who remembered being a World War II pilot who got shot down in his plane and he knew all sorts of details. Little James, yeah. Yeah, about the plane, et cetera. You know, and unfortunately, those cases were muddies by the fact that the parents realized that this was something that could, you know, get them a lot of attention. And whether they wanted it, you know, they claimed that that wasn't why they did it, but they were, you know, they wrote books that sold, you know, so it gives, it creates this motive for doing it other than getting the truth out, which I'm not saying that that's why they did it, but just if you're studying it, and you're trying to eliminate all possible normal explanations for how this occurred, it just muddies the waters and it makes it less clean cut. But, you know, some of these cases that, you know, that uh, came up in India were actually, you know, they, every time there was a theory about an alternative explanation, there was a, there were, you could find a case that kind of shot that down. Like for instance, you know, one all, you know, one all common alternative explanation is that the child was fantasizing about having a better life. And so why, you know, I don't why you know, I have these dumpy parents in this crappy little house and, you know, maybe, but obvi- but as I said, some of the cases were the reverse where people who were living pleasant middle-class lives were remembering, you know, growing up in a slum somewhere, um, you know, and people, who had wonderful parents were remembering having abusive parents. So what, you know, so there, there goes that one, Um, you know, and, or, you know, the, the fact that the, the, another theory was, well, maybe parents are sort of encouraging the child and feeding him information, not even consciously for fraud, but because the parents liked the attention, you know, that it brought them in the community. Well, then we run into a family where, you know, they didn't want to talk to us. They were like basically trying to slam the door in our faces. And then when we finally got to talk to them, you know, they're saying, well, this caused, when this came up before, you know, that this caused us, our family, all kinds of problems. And it, you know, we haven't really recovered from it yet and we can't write about it and we don't want to talk about it, et cetera. And then, you know, but in the next breath, the woman is saying, but everything that child said was true. And there was no way that that child could have known everything. And in the same case, here's another theory about why it might not be true, is that, you know, people want to think that their loved ones have come back out of, you know, out of grief and, and, missing them um, and that, you know, it's comforting to think they came back. So the same woman, I said, well, you think this little girl really knew this stuff about your mother that nobody else could have known? I said, "Um, well, did that make you feel better that your mother had somehow survived? And she said, no, it was creepy. I mean, here's this little girl who's like, you know, maybe was my, my mother's soul. It just said it really disturbed me, you know, so, and, and, you know, and and it's not just like one case that this proves it, but there are many cases. Um, so that, uh, I, you know, I, I, I just felt that it was a very compelling thing to study. Um, and, you know, and I really appreciated Stevenson's approach, which was, to try to find alternative explanations and then find evidence that contradicted that possibility. Right. He used to use the scientific method of, of uh, uh, challenging the claim and, and trying to disprove it rather than yeah. try to prove your confirmation bias. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. And, and he, he didn't like to say whether he actually, what he actually believed, but over time it became clear that he absolutely believed this. <laughs> and, you know, I think that, after so many years of after decades of of, of people not pay, taking his research seriously i think that he probably was a little bit over invested in in proving it was true as opposed to just doing the 
the research, but I mean, who can blame them <laughs> uh, when you're, when you're surrounded by this remarkably compelling uh, information and, and these, these kids who, you know, that's the thing when you're actually around them and the, around the adults that they grew into, you just sense that they're, you know, they're not in this for anything other than that they had a profound emotional experience of feeling connected to a family that was not their own and, and to feeling connected to a life that was gone now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you just sense that, that, you know, this is something that an experience uh, to them, it was a, a genuine and legitimate experience that they had. And they didn't care if anybody believed them or not. It was just something that was part of their lives. And that in a way it was, and, and how do you, you know, how, how do you uh, sort of calculate that in a scientific way, that, that sense of it, you know, they did one, one thing that happened was that, you know, they did have some psychologists come and like run tests on them to see where, were these kids psychotic or were they su more suggestible? And it turned out that they actually were very, you know, for, you know, as a, as a group, they were maybe just a little mentally healthier than their a random subgroup of their peers. And they were less suggestible uh, as a group. Um, you know, this is like based on somebody who came out and, and interviewed them and did psychological testing, et cetera. Now, one thing that struck me about your work, your book, Old Souls, which covers this uh, journey you took with Dr. Stevenson, is uh, the only other paranormal um, book that I've read that has the same caliber and, and ease of reading as yours does is by uh, Deborah Bloom, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, investigative journalist as well. And um, she wrote a book called Ghost Hunters and it chronicles the something of 250 years of scientific exploration into into paranormal phenomena. And she, she tells it the way that you tell your story in Old Souls, which is exactly that. You're telling a journey, a story. So it's almost like you're reading a story, except it's not fiction. It's just so eloquently written. And I think that makes it really um, accessible for people who are maybe new to this and want to uh, really dive in head first and get lost in the story that, and, and almost take the journey with you and Dr. Stevenson. Well, Tom, uh, I really appreciate you joining me today and hopefully uh, we'll keep in touch and, and maybe talk again down the road. I hope so. And, and thank you for such a uh, intelligent and thoughtful interview. I, I really enjoyed it. One thing that people ask me as a medium about reincarnation is, well, if people are reborn, how do you talk to the dead after they've died? And the answer to that is that sometimes people are reborn quickly, but that's very rare. Usually we have two to 300 years to have a summer vacation in the spirit world and meet up with our loved ones before we come back. We were lucky to have him survive um, in 2015 because his whole body was shutting down. He had the stroke. He actually was on the floor for six to eight hours by himself. He had driven me to the airport that morning and I had flown out to Calgary to be with my son and to help him with his girls while his wife was off um, training. And uh, that night we got a call on uh, about one o'clock in the morning that he had had, he was in the hospital, my girls were with him. Um, I flew out the next day and they told me that his body was shutting down, that he had had, he had double pneumonia, he had had a stroke, and he was in heart failure, his kidneys were shutting down, and that they didn't know if he was going to survive or not. First time we've met. It is the first time and we've met. And you were given my information uh, by a friend of yours, you were saying, who's also a medium. Yes. So you're somewhat familiar with this. Yes. That's really good when I sit with a client who understands. Yeah. So as I said, I keep my eyes closed. I'll tell you everything I see. I hold nothing back. Um, that doesn't mean I see everything. Yeah. But I, I will do my best. Names come through as initials only, and I try to guess the name, but okay. it, usually uh, the phonetics are kind of on. But it could be like if I see Joe instead of John, yeah. you know, it could be like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
I already have a presence with you coming forward. Oh, they came with you in the car today. I hear sweetheart. Hmm. I sense a contemporary to you, which in psychic language means someone in your age range, like in your generation. Um, did you just yes or no? Did you lose a husband? Yes. Okay. Because I'm seeing the widow symbol. My mother passed young and your husband would have been too young to have passed because I don't think he made it through his 60s even, it didn't seem. Or he was young at heart in a lot of ways because it feels like just as you guys come to this period where it's time to enjoy the golden years, yeah. he up and leaves. And yeah. he's so sorry about that, but he hasn't really left. You know that. <laughs> he's joking. He says, shit, she was right. This place is real. He wasn't as big a believer as you and all this stuff. <laughs> so he's laughing about that. He's like, well, you know, women, they're always right. <laughs> he's never far. He gives you kisses every night on the cheek when you go to bed. He's, he's attempted to use electronics to get a sign to you. So if something went wonky with the TV or lights or something, that's him doing it. Okay. Have you noticed anything like that? Sometimes. Okay. By the way, feel free to use that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, there is a J name that's, that's being acknowledged by him, but I think it's in the spirit world with him. Was there any Jack or John up there with him or J James? Any Jean. Jean? Yep. Is that him? It no, it's not him. It's with him in the spirit world though that Yes, that would be his aunt. His aunt Jean is the only one that I can think of. I want you to just keep this on record and remember because there might be ancestors you're not thinking of and you well know all how this works, so you'll find out who yeah. that is. It's a male. Oh it's a male, is it? Okay. Yeah, with a J, not a G. Jerry? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. But um he's just met with so many people. He hasn't been gone that long. They're still celebrating up there. Are we still in the first year? Yes, we are. He's, um, hold on, they're just calibrating because he's new at this and he's excited and he doesn't, he keeps going to talk to you and he's got to talk to me. <laughs> so he's just sort of turning and talking to you and I'm, I'm not, I'm losing the signal. He's funny. He's just excited. You two, you two were together forever, it feels like. Yes, we were. Like, were you high school sweethearts? Or, yes. Yeah. 17, 18, sort of? Yep. That's what he shows me, like my parents. You had more. I thought you had three kids. Why is he only showing two for some reason? I don't know. Hmm. Do you have three? Yes. Yeah. Two or, oh, is it like two boys, a girl or something? like? Not in that order? Yeah, it is like that. Yeah. 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 Because he's with all of them, eh? He's watching over all. He says, tell my kids I love them. Aww. He's telling me to tell his kids that he loves them. Yeah. He's like, I would never leave my kids. Like, I almost have tears coming. Because he's very fatherly, very loving as a father. Yeah. Some fathers are more cold. Yeah. He would, he would like, pick his sons up and give them a kiss. You know, he's like that. And, um, and his daughter's his his special girl fathers and daughters eh? fathers and daughters yeah there's two girls and a boy oh it's two girls okay good yeah is one of them the baby one of the girls yeah yeah because that one seems to really link to him psychically he's probably he's probably had more success reaching her in dream states as well as you but okay. the other two, your son and a, a daughter. The reason that I mixed it up was because I, my family has two girls and I'm the boy. Yes. So, and you guys are the same age my parents were when they met. Yes. It's too overlapping. It's really hard for me. <laughs> but but so but it's the it's the information that makes sense, not my interpretation. Yes. Yes. So, so he's very he's very present. Um, I don't know. I, I thought he had had a problem in his system that led to complications with the heart. I don't, I don't diagnose him as having a heart problem per, per se, um, but it feels like his passing was quick. He, he makes me feel like he comes and visits and he, I'm seeing the bedroom and I'm, I don't know how close the door into the room is to the closet, but I'm going to the closet and the door. Okay. And I just saw a shadowy figure coming. Like he's coming in that way, and he's, he he maybe knocks around there too. 
there's some there's something going on and it might even be a sign he's going to do for you okay but but i feel like you're going to get some validation that way you're not scared by that stuff no i'm not you just be you'd be happy i would be very happy and he's working on it he is working on it and he's just got such love such love he's free because he really hated being dependent on people at the end and having having that complicated health issue I know but you know I I see that he had his life review and one of the cool things for him was that he learned that the reason he died that way was because he spent his whole life taking care of others and he had to learn the final lesson of letting people help him yeah it was a, those spiritual lessons are freaking hard, eh? Yeah, no kidding. But, no kidding. But that was his final lesson. And, and, and did he all learn of it, you, though? he did. He did learn All that. of you really were an amazing. I also feel really bad that I was such the caregiver then and making sure that he was looked after and that he wasn't in pain and all of that, that I wish I had of talked to him more. I wish I had told him that, yes, he asked me at one point if he was dying, and I, I told him we were all dying. And uh, I wish that I had said that it's very possible that we had talked, and I wish I had told him over and over again and stressed it so much. What a wonderful life he provided for us, and that how lucky I was to have had him in my life. And he's apologizing for his moodiness, but that's just near-death grief. Um, and and I feel like my spirit guide is shaking her head no, like he he was a troop, he would really handled things well. But for him, in his point of view, like he was he was he was a little more moody than he would have liked to be. So because his family is golden to him. I knew that too. Beautiful. And now he's just shown me a birthday cake. And I, I can't understand if he's telling me that it's, it's soon the birthday for one of his kids or something, or if it was his, or if his death when that was, was near a birthday. Cause there's a, there's an overlap somehow. And Do I want to go, tell you? I almost want to say 15th or 14th, like in the middle of the month for some reason. Do, what, what are you thinking? The fifth is his birthday. Oh, the fifth is his birthday. Okay. Because he's trying to get the number to me. And is it of April? Yeah. Oh, my God. So it's like in a couple of days. Yes. Okay. Celebrate him on his birthday, the 5th, more than you do on the day he died. Because this is that he had more of these than he had deaths. And think of him then. And, and that's he will be with you on that day. He keeps trying to get the C, the C initial over to me. I don't know if it's Chuck. Charles or Carl or something like that. I, I can't quite grasp it. It could be Chris, but I, that's my brother-in-law's name, so I doubt. No, it's Chris. And is, it Chris is Chris him or his son? His son. Okay. Chris, it's his son. So it's like so many overlaps with my family that it's <laughs> hard know, for me I to know. get through, but <laughs> we're working through it. Yeah. So he just wants to tell his son something. So hold on, I'm going to get this proper. He's congratulating his son. And it's almost like a whole new chapter in life. But it, he's highlighting through love. Did your son have a marriage or a baby after your, or is that on the horizon possibly, would you say? No. Okay. Is he potentially capable of having a new chapter in his love life though, your son? I don't know. Because this could be a prediction, eh? Okay. And, it, it, and if it is, it's not far off. It's like in a year or within the year. Okay. So you should be hearing news because your son's love life is turning around and it, and it could end up being the partner or the ba the one that he has a baby with, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it could go far. Yeah, Chris. I don't very, think a baby. Very special, very special to Chris. Yeah, well, it, whatever the next step yeah. would be for him. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like he's had... Could it be work related? No, this no. is love life. But work okay. is part of it too, but it's not what he means okay. in this particular instance. Okay. Yeah, you'll see. So when I see a new chapter in love, it's either meeting someone that's going to be a partner, if they have a partner, getting married, if they're married, buying a house, if they have a house, having a baby. 
It's okay. whatever the next step for them. That's how it comes through to me. Okay. But but he's highlighting that as the next turnaround. And and something's making me feel like it should be obvious to you that that part of his life could use a turnaround. Yes. Like that should be obvious to you. Yes, and it is. That's what your hubby is trying to convey here. Okay. And he's working on it from his end. But he loves his son. I, I don't know. He's kind of laughing. He's saying, my boy is a lot like me. Like, even if mom shows him this reading, he's just, he's not going to accept it. No. <laughs> he's like, oh, ma, what are you embarrassing yourself for? Mm. You know, he's kind of hard-headed like his father. Yeah. So he's laughing about that. <laughs> now, he puts a letter above himself, which means it's either his name or it's someone that he's with that's very, very, very close to him from his family history. And the letter is the letter A. So do you know who that might be up there with His him? father. His father, okay. Alex. Alex, okay. Did he lose his father too soon or was that a big death for him? It would have probably been a big death for him. It was yeah. his dad. Yeah. Because He's in his 80s, so. Oh, but they and loved, he loved his dad. He loved his I dad. I feel like his dad was the one who came to get him. Mm. Because he puts the name above himself like it was like a real protectorate to him someone very special so I'll accept that it's his dad for yeah. sure he's like uh, okay so he's showing me something he's trying to show me something that I don't know if I'm getting it clearly from him so it's like he shows me a pillow and you know how you can have pictures printed on onto fabric mm -hmm. so I can't tell if what he's trying to do is show me that you've got the, the picture on, in a frame next to the bed if that's a symbol he's merging the two or if literally one of the girls is going to silk screen a picture of the two of you or something on a pillow as a gift or something but mm. he's, he's showing me something like that I can't tell what he's talking about mm -hmm. but he is very much at peace keeps throwing names at me I, I, I don't love when they do that <laughs> but I, I can't control it so um, the other thing he's showing an H he's putting across to me I think I'm interpreting that more like a Henry or Harold or something like that I, you see he's new over there it feels and I feel like he's just been getting to, to reacquaint with all of his ancestors so in a sense you could interpret what's happening now is he's telling you that he's not alone um and you'll find all those names in his history. Yeah. They, some of them he didn't meet even, they're, but they're, they're his family. Yeah. He's got this sort of beautiful um, recreation of an old car up there. It's, it looks like it's in a, in a teal or a, a teal or a blue family color. Okay. And uh, it really looks like an old car. I can't tell if it's a Mustang or if it's, um, I know they're very different cars, yeah, Mustangs and Chevys, but I, yeah. I honestly can't tell because I'm not a car person, but it reminds me of something beautiful like that. Did he have an affinity for those types of machines? He, yes, he had for, to a Mustang, yeah. To a Mustang, and was it a blue color? I think so, yeah, it was blue and white, I think. Yeah. You'll find old pictures. Yes. And if you do, Please just take your phone, snap a picture. Okay, and send, send it, it to, to you? Yeah. Okay, send it to Dina. Yeah. Okay. Because these are the things we overlay. Okay. Um, but he's recreated things up there, and he's even got a house um, that, you know, when you visit him, you'll see him there. You'll be there with him. Um, the, the landscape feels like it's somewhere where there's there could be waterfalls but canadian waterfalls not mm -hmm. not tropical or, or uh, f you know foreign like sort of like a rocky sort of uh, forests and things but just beautiful I'm getting like i see the front of this sort of building this house that's sort of manifested or recreated there it's got like stone beautiful stone slabs and 
like a like a wraparound porch. It's like quite nice. It's almost like the house he wished he could have built you. Yes, he likes stone and he like yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's 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 modern and open, but it's rustic. It's really cool, and that's where you'll that's where you'll meet him, because you can see them and meet them in your dreams before you pass. You yeah. don't have to wait to die. You leave your body sometimes. Everybody does. Yes. And he's working on it, getting you up there. He's working on helping you have a dream visitation because you've been wanting those. Did you have one already? I, I, I yes. Mm -hmm. um, nothing like that, though. It was no. different. Different. It might have been overlaid with some of your grief. Yes. Because there was something not pleasant about that particular dream. He was trying yeah. to break through, but your grief overlaid some hallucinations over top. Okay. But it'll yeah. be beautiful, and you're going to have it closer to um, the summertime. I'd say roughly June, July is when you'll probably get success with that, is my prediction. Is that close to an anniversary for you or a birthday for June, you? June uh, is when he passed. June's when he passed. Okay, because that's when he'll really press through. Good. Was it close to the 13th or 12th of June? 14th. Yeah, because he's he didn't really know the date, but he's like, it's around the 13th, he yeah. said. Well, and he could have passed in the 13th because he had a pacemaker, so right. maybe that kept him. So the heart was a thing, though. It, yeah, the but, heart. But there was it wasn't the leading cause, but the heart was an issue, and there were complications from other things. Yeah, and it, it probably was the leading cause. Yeah, you would say? Okay. He had had a stroke and he was in heart failure. His kidneys were shutting down and that they didn't know if he was going to survive or not. They put him into, an, they induced a coma and he was in it for about 10 days and we didn't know if he would come out of it. But he did and, and the minute he started coming out of it, he started to re recover really well, as much as he could. He, um, he, had, he was left-handed and he never regained the use of his left hand. Um, and he ended up again getting a defibrillator and a pacemaker. And for the next three years, it was a lot of going to doctors and they, he, they kept telling us how very ill he was. And he was very weak and he certainly had changed from the man that he was to somebody who was, you know, he just had a hard time dealing with, with his illness. But I was, I truly believed that those three years were a gift to myself and, and to his family, his two girls and his son. But then in 2018, he, uh, he had a stroke in April and um, ended up in the hospital. And we were at the hospital until he passed away, basically. Um, he had two more strokes after that. So in total, he had four strokes. And they just told me at the hospital, and I stayed day and night with him, and in very few nights did I come home to sleep. Uh, and then um, we had problems at the hospital, and I wasn't really happy with what they were doing or their care, but that's why I stayed there. Um, That's what I said. I'm like, his heart gave out, but it felt like he was sick. Yeah. You know, so I guess we can say, but do you want to clarify what his cause was? Yes. Well, he had a stroke. So, well, he had more, he had multiple strokes. So, and it was caused from the blood heart. clots from the heart. Blood clots. I was going to say embolitic. Yeah. Poor old boy. Poor old boy. Because the strokes were causing his motor, motor functions to not work too. But he, um, he makes me feel like he wasn't, suffering at the very end did he just lose consciousness or was he asleep uh i took him to hospice so yeah. they kept him yeah very good they treated him real good they did treat him like good. i feel like they were really great at that which hospice was it in bear here yeah it's good fabulous it's a good one eh so yeah. I, I worked with hospice king aurora yes and uh when i was young and and i did um i worked with a group of teenagers but he was in a real good one he makes me feel they took perfect care now, all of you were there for yeah. him everybody came through yeah he has no regrets eh 
<laughs> he's like me. I don't I don't get the idea of regret. I don't it doesn't make yeah. sense to me. <laughs> As some people I don't know, maybe maybe I just came in life having that lesson learned from another life and he's the same. He doesn't have any regrets. He's making a That's joke. Good. It's like I don't even have money hidden in the walls. I have nothing for <laughs> <laughs> now did you choose to stay in your house yes yeah he said he's happy with that he's okay with it there might come a time where you choose to move in the distant future but it will only be when you're ready you're okay to stay the grandkids come eh yeah they need that place you have the rooms for them I don't know why, but he's joking about something with the yard. So, um, like he wants you to get people to come and mow and do all the things that need to be done. And, uh, you know, hire some boys and get them in there and you can do the gardening. He's like telling you what to do. Yeah, <laughs> that's him. You know, because I feel like he would have done that for you. You know, that would have been his thing. If he could. Yeah. But it's like you hire the right people and, and he's happy about that. He's telling me something about the roses that he's gonna like put energy into to help them grow. Mm. Every night, like every night that your head goes down on the pillow, even if the TV's on or you're awake, he just kisses you right on the cheek. <sighs> so it, some people- I need to be more aware of that because I don't, can't say I feel that. I know, you can't because it's not physical. It's in the slight, it's out of phase with our dimension, but he, he feels it and he's there with you. So people, sometimes the spirit people only come once a week or something. He's like, he visits you every single day. <laughs> You're his honey. I love that. He loves you too. He loves you too. This is, he's working hard at this, but he keeps on turning to you and talking to you. Oh. And I keep, I got to say, come on, focus on me. Focus on me. Yell at me. <laughs> but, but he's, he's new at this, eh? Like he's. Your girlfriend had him come through a little bit? Or she had a dream, is that right? She could, yep, yeah. she could. But he's sort of new at this still. Doesn't feel like he's really done this officially in a funny kind of way. I, I think he was surprised to even be there. It's like right when the movie comes to an end, he's like, oh, wow, I'm just, I'm still here, okay. <laughs> was he skeptical of this sort of thing in life um or just not his cup of tea he just didn't look into the, it much. The, the, of psychic no the, the afterlife oh the afterlife um he was very private about that yeah <laughs> yeah he was surprised to be standing outside his body and, and and go over to the spirit world with his dad yeah Do you have, did you prepare or have some form of a question or a message for him that you want to try posing and I'll see if he gives an answer? Um, I have the, Dean, Dean asked me to put five questions together and I did. Mm -hmm. um, you can read them and okay. I'll tell you if I get responses. Okay. Because I really feel that they're based on your husband in the spirit world because he's the main yeah. thing communicating today. Yeah. yeah. He sees everything. He sees everything that you guys do. But I think part of it is that we've got him on the spot. He's a little shy or maybe it's he's private. So he's sort of <laughs> with the cameras and me and everything. He's sort of weird about talking to me. <laughs> so I want you to coax him a bit and we'll see if he can okay. respond. I wanted to know if he gave up living like the hospital said. He did. Not consciously. It wasn't a conscious choice. It was a soul's choice. So it's almost like you, you don't mean to. It's sort of, you drift into it, if that makes any sense. Did I make the right decision by taking him to hospice? 100%. He, at the end of his life, and this ties into the moody stuff and everything, he of course wanted to be at home in the sense that at least you cannot think about it so much there. Like when you're in a care situation, you have no choice but to face the fact that you're 
that you're passing or you're at the end of your life. And that was, I think, something that he, he worked through. But that was part of that spiritual lesson that was such a big message for you today where he had this lesson to learn to let people take care of him, which was tough for him. But he, he really learned it. So he'll never have to do that in any other lifetime again. Um, he would not have had the medical, uh, the drugs that he needed if he was at home. They wouldn't have been a, administered the right way in the, in the way that they were. He's like, we could all be so lucky how they treated him. Yeah, he I feels took him from the hospital, which I didn't think gave him the care that he needed to hospice. Good, that was the exact right decision. She had a wedding at hospice before he passed before August, it was in June. And did he, does he recall that? Does he, was he present in that even though he I was, didn't know if he was? He was present in that. He was peripherally present, but when he left his body, he was able to relive it from a superposition and be there and sense everyone's thoughts and be present with you. It's a little difficult to explain. It's time is not linear like we think. Yeah. So we can come back and relive things after. And he most definitely did that. Okay. Did he always know that I loved him from the bottom of my heart? Top to bottom. Top to bottom. And you know that he was the same. You two are like soulmates. You know, it wasn't always easy. That's the thing. People have to realize it's it's not easy. Yeah. But nothing is. And no. the love was what made it worth it. And that's the feeling I had. But it comforts you to know that you can connect with the person that you love, the people that you love. You know, it uh, answers some questions and, and makes, you know, I always wondered if taking him to hospice was the right. And when he said 100%, it certainly made me feel a little bit more at ease, I guess, because I always feel as though, you know, taking him to hospice was, um, it's hard to let go somebody but he told me a lot of good things and it was Wayne absolutely and talking about his kids and yeah it's all good it's all good it's I really enjoyed that I felt he made a connection and yeah I always wanted to know what it was that he loved about me but he could never tell me let's find out I'll see if you can <laughs> if you could word that now yeah well, you're cute. It's a cuteness. And it's, it's ineffable. It's also a soul connection. And he felt it was his responsibility to protect you. That's the nature of how his love went with you. Yeah. It was like, cute, protect. And, um, he, I can tell he, he's the type of person who means what he says and says what he means. And he's simple in his wording. He's not exactly speaking Shakespearean to me today. Like you can tell even from the reading that it's sort of, every message is a burp, 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 burp. Do you recognize that as his personality yeah. though? Yeah. Good, good. Cause that's what I have to work with. And so yeah. like you're his wife since teenagehood, right? Well, yeah. not wife since, but you know, yeah. and it even you can't sense. describe yes. why. Yes. So yes. How do you think I feel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he is, I think he showed it to me. It's it, you are cute, and he very protective of you. Did you recognize yes. those energies? With well, him? certainly protective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I That's always wanted him to put it into words what he loved about me, but he couldn't. He couldn't put them into words to me. So. Yes. Yeah. He was. He was more of a show. A show you type. Like yes. a show me type. Yeah. I'm, I'm here, aren't I? Is the, the feel? Yes. That's what I just heard. Yeah. It's like I'm here, yeah. aren't I? That's that means I love you. felt interesting with Lynn because her husband wasn't much for self-expression and whenever a medium has to deal with a spirit who can't emote or express themselves openly it's a little like dragging a horse through the mud um, and I felt that way for sure but you know when you're reviewing these sorts of things and thinking about it from the medium's perspective I don't know who's coming to me I don't know why they're here so his soul was able to identify himself as the husband he was able to identify his cause of death. He was able to identify his children and 
sort of the framework of his life. And, and I thought that was pretty cool. But I would like to work more with Lynn in the future and see if I can't pull him through even further. And something about him tells me he was gifted in the material world. And so he's still trying to figure out exactly what to do with himself in the spirit world. It's like, it's kind of like being retired and, and, and not knowing what to do with yourself because you, you're free and you don't have obligation. And uh, in some ways that's a wonderful thing. And, and I find myself very happy for her husband.